All right, we're going to see if the lav mic makes a difference. Ready? Hold on. Ah. All right, there we go. You know, there were moments I didn't think we would ever get here, but here we are. I forgot to put lipstick on. All right, I remembered the lipstick. Crisis averted. So if you have been watching my channel for the past two-ish years, then you probably know that I have had this very big, very intimidating, very stressful, giant white project just hanging over my head for the past two years. And I am proud to finally be able to report that I did it. I finished it. I finished my wedding dress. I went ahead and got married. It was down to the wire, I'm telling you. There were moments I didn't think that it was going to happen, but it did somehow through some miracle. So over the next couple of days, I will be releasing some vlog videos. I have been vlogging the entire process. Some of this is over a year and a half old. But in this video today, I wanted to kind of talk about the general project of the dress. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of how I did it, of how I constructed the different parts of it. I'm going to walk you through my inspirations, my thought process, a little bit of the construction process, and overall just my final thoughts about the project. Now, in general, as you watch the vlogs and as you watch kind of my real-time progress and the things that I was thinking of doing and all of my plans, it, it, sometimes they didn't always work out. Honestly, most of the times they didn't work out. There were a lot of things that I got for this project that I wound up not using. Some of it I just genuinely forgot about. A lot of it came down to I severely underestimated the amount of time it would take me to actually piece everything together and put together a final dress. So if you hear me mention something that I never bring up again, uh, there's probably a good reason I just didn't do it. Um, I did want to leave that footage in because it was stuff that I thought about in the moment and it was part of my thought process at the moment, even if it didn't have anything to do with the final result. Now, one more note about the vlogs that I do want to touch on before I start getting into the tutorial and start talking about the construction of the dress is that I'm going to be honest, this whole process was not overwhelmingly positive because I feel like a lot of these wedding dress vlogs people talk about oh it was such a wonderful experience I feel so fulfilled I enjoyed every single part of the process this whole thing was just incredible um, I do it all over again and to be a hundred percent honest I just I don't feel that same way because honestly I struggled a lot throughout this entire process I didn't really struggle so much with the dress as much as I struggled mentally, I struggled emotionally, I struggled physically. And I really thought about cutting out just all of the bad, the ugly, and just leaving the good. But I thought it would be very inauthentic because I did have a rough time. This wasn't all, you know, sunshine and rainbow and roses and beads and lace and wonderful, incredible memories. No, this, this got really rough at some points. There were a lot of times where I really just wanted to quit. There were a lot of times where I wanted to just throw in the towel and just go buy a dress. And this whole process was unnecessarily stressful, which is also part of the reason why I don't have much footage from the last like two weeks. Because basically once I got down to Louisiana and had to start assembling the dress, it was go, go, go nonstop. I thought it would only take me about you know, three or four days to actually assemble the overskirt and get all the petals on and get everything situated. I thought I would have maybe a day to finish up all the tacking on the lace on my underdress and finish up the hem and all that. It wound up taking me close to two weeks just to assemble the overskirt. And I was cutting it down to the wire because the last two weeks before a wedding are always incredibly stressful because you have all of these things that you didn't realize you put off until the last minute. A lot of times this is when the final payments for all of your vendors are due because you pay a deposit when you book them and then they give you a little bit more time to get the final payment in. Then I had to coordinate everybody coming in from out of town and then my wedding planner just made my life way more stressful than it needed to be. You know, and I feel like I kind of missed out on a lot of the like pre-wedding stuff. I didn't really get to have as much of a good time as I wanted to. I didn't get to hang out with people and reconnect with people as much as I wanted to because I had to keep leaving events to go work on the dress. And let me tell you, for some reason, everybody else around me seemed to get way more offended and concerned when I would mention like, oh yeah, the dress isn't finished yet. Like people acted like it was personally inconveniencing them. And I'm and I'm just sitting there like I can guarantee you, of everybody in this room, I am the person most stressed out about it. 
but through nothing short of a miracle, thanks to my mother, my cousins, my aunts all coming together and helping me the night before to just get the last little finishing touches done, I managed to walk down the aisle with a finished dress. So if you are interested to see the, all of the behind the scenes, all of the stress and decision making and chaos as it was happening, come back to my channel over the next couple of days. I have plenty of vlogs ready to go waiting for you to see. If you want to watch me not understand math for dozens of weeks at a time, because there's a lot of that. There's a lot of me just not thinking right, which I do want to say, I did eventually figure everything out. So, you know, you can sit there and tell me in the comments like, oh, hey, this is how you fix this. This is how you do this. This is why this isn't working out. Here's where your math went wrong. Oh, you should have cut it like this instead of cutting it like this. <laughs> Thanks. Can't do anything about it now. <laughs> it's done. We're done. Wedding's over. Fig I figured it out. So if you want to watch that process, check out my upcoming videos. But for now, let's go ahead and jump into me talking about the finished dress. So just like many other little girls who grew up in New Orleans, my dream wedding was always going to be at the St. Louis Cathedral. It was one of those things that I didn't think was actually going to be feasible. I always pictured it being wildly expensive, but in all honesty, the actual ceremony part was like stupid cheap. Not stupid cheap, but compared to the reception, the ceremony was like so cheap. So when Coleman and I started doing research into where we wanted our wedding to take place, the kind of venues that we were looking at, uh, where we narrowed down what city we wanted the wedding to be in, we eventually realized that the St. Louis Cathedral was actually feasible for us. At the time when we were planning, our guest list was around 250 to 300 people because we are both from very large, very Catholic families. So as soon as we had nailed down that we were getting married in the cathedral, I knew that I needed a big dress that kind of stood its own in the cathedral. Although don't tell anybody, I kind of designed the dress like way before I even had the ring and before I had the boyfriend. So my two biggest source of inspirations for this dress were two very famous dresses from mid-century history. So the first dress that I found inspiration from was this Givenchy dress that was worn by Audrey Hepburn in the movie Sabrina. So there were a couple of things that I really loved about this dress. The first thing is that it's very clearly two separate pieces. It is a smaller, more manageable cocktail dress and then a huge ball gown overskirt. And I liked the idea of having a detachable overskirt so I could still have the big drama, the aesthetics of having a big ball gown. But if I got to the reception and I didn't want to deal with having all that fabric around anymore, I could just take it off and go. Also, I keep hearing horror stories about brides not being able to pee in their wedding dresses and needing like teams of people to help them pee. And I, I didn't want that. I'm not that kind of person. I also like the idea of having a smaller, much more manageable dress underneath because I knew that I was going to spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort on this wedding dress. And I always thought it was such a shame that even if you just go to a store and buy a wedding dress, you still spend so much money and so much effort on picking out this dress and you only get to wear it once. So my idea was I wanted to have a cocktail dress underneath so that if I ever wanted to go to the symphony or the ballet or, or something, I would still have a nice white cocktail dress. This whole process makes me sound way more fancy than I am. I'm really not. I also saw the video of her kind of twirling around the tennis court and I just, I loved the movement of that skirt so much. I fell in love with it and I knew I wanted something very similar to it. My other big piece of inspiration was the absolutely stunningly beautiful Dior Junon gown. I mean, this, this gown speaks for itself. It's beautiful. A couple of years ago, when I went up to New York to see the Heavenly Bodies exhibition at the Met, I also popped over to FIT, which is the Fashion Institute of Technology, which I heard of because I went to, it was at the time, FIT, the Florida Institute of Technology. We lost the lawsuit. We are now officially Florida Tech. <laughs> So I went up to visit the other, so I went up to visit the New York FIT and they had their pink exhibition and they had the Venus gown there. And I absolutely fell in love with the sister Venus gown. Again, stunningly beautiful. I loved the petals. I loved the shape of the petals. I loved how they sparkled. And as I learned more about the dress, then I found the Junon dress and I just 
absolutely head over heels in love. So I had been playing around with the idea of kind of mixing those two ideas together. So I knew I wanted a huge detachable overskirt, but I also liked the idea of the petals because I knew on each petal, if I was embroidering them and if I was coming up with the designs and if I was putting beads on them, I knew I would be able to kind of hide messages in there, hide little details, hide little homages to um, myself and my story and Coleman and our story together. So I thought and I thought and I thought and I eventually sat down and I sketched out what I would picture to be my dream dress. And what I wound up with was actually, it was pretty close. So I did all of the embroidery for all of the petals by myself. So I got started on that as soon as I could because I knew that I had a lot of petals to do and I knew that it would take a very long time. So through the magic of YouTube, and in particular, a really great professor named Bob Haven out of the University of Kentucky, and his videos, I managed to teach myself tambour embroidery. I am still nowhere near an expert on the subject, but I learned what I needed to do. I got what I needed to do done, and I think everything turned out really pretty well. So one thing that I did was I came up with a unifying design to go around the edges of all of the petals. This way, all of them would look kind of cohesive. They would look like they were from the same set. Now, at this point, when I had started designing, we had already chosen our reception venue, which was the New Orleans Museum of Art. I really like it. I enjoy it. My favorite painting there is Marie. I like to go say hi to Marie Antoinette every time that I'm up there. So Coleman and his family came to New Orleans for their annual family vacation. So we went to the art museum. And while I was there, I noticed there was a lot of very beautiful architecture and little architectural and sculptural details around the building itself. And I really wanted to bring in those motifs into my wedding dress. The one motif in particular is this shell kind of flower motif because many things around the city that were built around that same time have the same shell motif on it. So I knew that I wanted to incorporate it into my design. I thought it was very beautiful. It's all over the museum. And I also liked the little swirlies underneath it. So I played around with that and that's how I came up with my general petal design. And then once I had that general design, I was able to go nuts. I put all kinds of things into this embroidery. I put sharks, I have stars, I have molecules, I have pets, all kinds of stuff. You name it, it's on my dress. But once I had my petal design finalized, I had my frame that I built myself that I will link up into a card over here. I have a video about my constructing my PVC embroidery frame which it worked out perfectly. It was very modular. I could move it around to exactly the size I needed. It was perfect. It did exactly what I needed it to. 10 out of 10, love that thing. So once I had my design finalized, I took the nylon tool that I was stitching on. I stretched it over my frame and I attached it to my frame. Next, I took my frame into the guest room and using a projector, I projected the design of the petal onto the tool from which I was able to trace out the outline of the shape onto the tool. I had to measure it to make sure that the petal was going to be the exact size that I needed it to be. Then once everything was traced out, I took the frame into my room, darkened up all the lines and sat down and just stitched and stitched and stitched. I wound up backing all of these petals with two layers of fabric. One was a beautiful chiffon, which was given to me by God himself, there is no other explanation. Watch the vlog and I'll tell you all about it. But there was one layer of this beautiful, shiny, iridescent chiffon and then a lining fabric beneath that. So I stitched them on, clipped the curves, turned them right side out, and then I had my final petals. When it came to constructing the base of the overskirt, I spent a very long time, a very, 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 very long time trying to figure out how I wanted to construct this, the shape of the pattern pieces to try to get the shape that I wanted. I wanted to have that same kind of peacock shape that we saw in the Givenchy dress, but I didn't want there to be any gathers at the top because I didn't want to have to worry about the petals getting like caught and lost and folded in the gathers. I had to go back to Victorian era skirt patterns to get the shape that I wanted because looking back on the footage, the reason that the pattern never worked was because I treated it like a half circle and I was trying to make rectangles out of a circle and that just doesn't work. You have to make triangles out of a circle. So that's where I went wrong. I know that now. I didn't know that at the time, but eventually I figured it out, you know, and then believe it or not, the uh, overskirt all of, all of that underneath there is just a white cotton Walmart bed sheet. I also had to consult a different truly Victorian pattern to get the closure method of the overskirt. I talk a lot in the vlogs about constructing a corset and building a corset into the dress. That wound up not happening. I just didn't actually sit down and like fuss everything out. But what I did was I essentially built 
a little waspy corset into the overskirt, which all that just to say that the belt of the overskirt is very wide and it has a little bit of a shape to it and it has rivets in the front so I could lace it close. Then I came up with a sort of cummerbund belt cover to cover all of that up and make it look nice and pretty. And when I tell you that I thought that attaching the pedals to the overskirt was only going to take me like a grand total of four or five hours, I was wrong. I was wrong, 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 wrong. I spent an entire night just working straight through the night. I did not sleep. That was the night before my rehearsal. So I didn't get to sleep at all. I just sat there tacking all of that on. I didn't even get to like whip stitch it or properly stitch it down. I had to tack it at strategic points because there was no way I was going to get everything stitched on in time. I watched almost an entire season of Spongebob and I did have one pedal that I think I just didn't that I think I missed when I was tacking it on because it fell off the dress and I could not for the life of me figure out where it fell off from. And I was very disappointed because that was one of my favorite pedals. Um, it's from when I'm 64, 64 is my lucky number. Um, it's popped up in my life for a very long time. That's a story for another day. Um, and since that was the pedal that fell off and I could not figure out where to stick it back on, um, it just didn't make it onto the dress exactly. And then I can pinpoint exactly where it is from the photos of me on the altar there is one little blank spot and that's that's where that pedal was supposed to go. I also needed to tack the pedals to each other at strategic points to make sure that they didn't fold back in over themselves. While I was designing and while I was working on kind of the theory behind this dress, I had initially planned to put some horsehair braid in the hems of all of the pedals. I wound up not using that horsehair braid, which means I have a ridiculous amount of horsehair braid somewhere in the sewing room. I have not finished unpacking. I don't know where it is. Um, so you may be seeing a lot of really structural projects for me in the future just to use all of that up. But in truly a team effort, again, my mom, my cousins, and my aunt, we all came together the night before the wedding. They were helping me tack all the petals so that they would lay nicely, um, so that they wouldn't fold over themselves, so that you would actually be able to see them. Um, so I absolutely would not have been able to do it without them. So I am incredibly grateful for them for helping me at that very last minute. So that was in short how I constructed the overskirt. Uh, one very important thing that I did not talk about much in the vlogs was I needed to help shape the overskirt. So what I did was I got myself, I think, 10 yards of crinoline net, which is just a really, really stiff tool-like net, but it's, it's super stiff. It's meant to help things hold their shape. So basically what I did was I made a wedge. I cut out a bunch of strips. I made some like 10 inch strips, 15 inch strips, 20 inch strips, and I just gathered all of those down. And I made some rows along the bottom to help the bottom poof out. And then I also made some rows at the very top to help the top poof out and have that shape that I was looking for. Someone's texting me, make sure it's not Coleman insurance. Not my problem anymore. Haha, <laughs> I got married. I get better insurance now. And this overskirt is heavy. I have not weighed it yet, but it's, I would not be shocked if it was close to 15, 20 pounds. It's a lot. Now the underdress was so much more simple to make. I've made it before on the channel. I'll link a card up to here. Um, I absolutely love this dress. I absolutely love this pattern. I love how it fits. Um, I love how it looks on me. I love the pockets. The pockets were primo. So I was not ever really concerned about the underdress because I knew the pattern. I knew how it worked. I did accidentally bleed on it a couple of times, but some hydrogen peroxide just took that right out. The only real change that I made to it was I lengthened the hem and I moved the slit from the front to the back. But other than that, that was... I, I just made that dress. I tacked some lace on it the night before. The lace on the top of that dress was what I was working on until 2.30 in the morning the night before the wedding. Um, I am very disappointed that I didn't get to tack lace on the pockets or the hem of the dress, which I had initially planned to do, but it was 2.30 in the morning. I did not go to bed at all the night before. I was exhausted. I had to, you know, be awake in five hours for the hair and makeup people. And so I just... I tacked on the lace and I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to bed. Good night. I also made the dress out of the exact same fabric that I made for my blue version. It just was white instead of blue. 
I did also opt for a lapped zipper instead of an invisible one because I tried to put in an invisible zipper and then the zipper broke. Like that wasn't me, that was the zipper. I got a bad zipper and I said, you know what? It's a sign, no more invisible zippers. Nope, uh -uh, not doing it. And that is the story of how I made my wedding dress. So something that I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put a little bit of math, a little bit of explanation up on the screen and I'm going to break down the cost and how much that this dress cost me to make. I'm going to have one part that is the absolute total cost of everything that I spent for this project. Plus or minus about 15 bucks of stuff I picked up, you know, here and there that I didn't save the receipt for. And then I'm also going to do a cost that's a little bit more indicative of what I actually spent on this project because I may have gone a little bit overboard with the beading and all of the beads that I bought. I wound up not using a lot of it. Because again, I, I very much underestimated the amount of time that it would take to fully bead all of the petals. So I just did a couple little beads here and there to give it some sparkle. I'm also real quick going to pull up my little time tracker app. Oh wait, no, I wrote it down with my, uh, my little Instagram post. Which shameless plug for my Instagram at thread and needlefish. All right, so my grand total of time that I spent working on this dress that I recorded in my little tracker app was about 128 hours of tambour embroidery, 19 hours of sewing on appliques, 35 hours of overskirt construction, 13 hours of underdress construction, and about six hours of all hands on deck, myself, my cousins, my aunts, just tacking everything on at the very last possible minute the night before the wedding. So I spent a lot of time on this dress. So the labor was probably the most expensive part of this dress. And since I'm doing it for myself, I didn't really have to pay myself. But if somebody asked me or commissioned me to make a similar dress for them, um, this is the number of how much just the labor would cost for remaking this dress. <laughs> I have not done that math yet. I don't quite know if I want to know. So a couple just like little rapid fire little things that I want to point out um, if you've either watched the vlogs and you've come back to this or if you're going to watch the vlogs. Um, for all the talk that I did about having a cathedral length veil because I got married in a cathedral, I wound up not doing a cathedral length veil. I am a little bit disappointed by it. I didn't think it was ever actually going to work out, but eh, you, you, you do what you do. I wound up not using any material material from either my mom's dress or my mother-in-law's dress. I honestly just didn't really have a need for it. I did take lace off of both of their dresses and you will see that process in the vlogs. You'll see me struggle over some of it because some of it was a struggle. I talk a lot about the horsehair braid that I ordered. I did not use the horsehair braid. And I really just want to kind of reiterate before these vlogs go out that they're... <laughs> They get rough. There are a lot of really vulnerable low moments that are recorded in these vlogs. Something that I personally struggle with, and it's not a secret that I've struggled with, is I struggle with my weight. You know, it's one of those things that we don't really like to talk about, but it's reality is that, especially when you grew up doing um, especially ballet, but really any type of performance or sports, you know, it's one of, you're kind of taught from an early age that your value is dependent on your weight and it's really messed up. Maybe that can be a conversation for another day, another time, not right now. But also just going back and watching footage from a year ago and seeing how my face has changed since then and how I have changed since then, it's very odd because I'm slowly starting to become at peace with everything and I'm slowly starting to accept my body for what it is right now. But to go back and watch even just a year ago, it's, it is very odd. But again, I just want to point out that I want to give you the real, I want to give you a real look into what the real life process of making this wedding dress was like. You know, I want to show you the struggle. I want to show you the, the times where I got really low and I got really vulnerable and that this was in fact an incredibly stressful project. And to be honest, I don't think I would recommend doing it. I would not do this again for myself. There are moments where I get very, very frustrated with myself, with the people around me, with the situations that I'm in. And to be 100% honest, I want to look back on it and say, oh yeah, look what I overcame and I still wound up with, you know, my dream dress. When in reality, I'm looking at the dress and pretty much all I can see is the agony that it put me through, the stress that it put on me, and that there was still so much that I just didn't get done. 
you know, that there was still so much that I did not accomplish and things that I wanted to put on the dress and petals that I wanted to make that just didn't happen. Because it would be very easy for me to come up here in front of the camera and say, oh, I'm so happy with it. I'm so proud of myself. I did so great. Um, everybody loved it, which that being said, I did get a lot of compliments on it all night, but I think it was because people knew I made it and they just wanted to say something nice to me. But I have complicated feelings about it. Just, it's life. You get complicated feelings about things. You don't always feel the way you thought you would. Now, the marriage, I'm happier than I've ever been. I love being married to Coleman. I love being able to call him my husband. I have no issues with that. The dress? Eh. The marriage? It's going great. Love it. Could not be happier. But the wedding process? I don't recommend it. If you have even like an inkling of a thought in your brain to elope, do it. The wedding industry is chaos. Don't do it. Don't put yourself through it. It's not worth it. Now, since I do have a lot of very interesting petals on my dress and a lot of very interesting designs, some of them kind of have a hidden meaning. Some of them do not make any sense whatsoever unless you know the backstory behind them. Uh, let me know if you're interested in seeing me go through all of my designs and kind of talk about it. I would like to either make a website or get a blog going where I have everything documented and I have like a little blurb about everything written out. But let me know if you'd like me to sit down and like go through the dress petal by petal and, and tell you about all of them. There are a lot, so that's why I didn't put it in this video. Although something funny that happened throughout this process was this was a bit of a full circle moment was kind of towards the end in like August of this year, I found this online like stitch in group. We all just kind of sit in front of Zoom and like work on whatever embroidery that we're working on. And it was started by Bob Haven, who was the guy who did the tutorials that taught me how to tambour embroider. He's like one of the leading experts in tambour embroidery, um, definitely in the US, if not like in the world. And he's just chilling and I and I get to talk to him twice a week and he's just just chilling just talking about his you know workshops that he's given and every now and then he, he shows us his, his little kitty cat and it was definitely an odd full circle moment but uh it happened so that's about all I want to say right now but I do want to say thank you so much for supporting me and my channel I have gotten so many subscribers over the past year I don't know where you all came from because I have not put out content like, I just crossed the 500 mark, and then, you know, I just got a notification from Snapchat two years ago when I just crossed the 100 mark. So, you know, thank you for watching my videos. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for subscribing to me. Now that I get to work with things that are not white, I am so excited to get some color back into my life and back into my wardrobe. I have a lot of things lined up. I have a lot of fabric that I've been accumulating over the past year and a half. Um, just with projects ready to go, ready for me to sit down and start working on them. Because I couldn't, because I couldn't justify spending time on things that weren't my wedding dress. But I have, I have a coat, I have a jumper, I have a dress, I have, I have so much stuff that I am so excited to sit down and start working on. So if you are interested in seeing the vlogs of the wedding dress making process, um, give me subscribe. Those will be going up one a day over the next couple of days. If you're interested in other sewing shenanigans, we'll eventually start posting things again. And if you have any questions about the dressmaking process, um, feel free to leave those in the comments below. I might wind up making like a Q&A video after everything goes up and has been up for a little while. Also feel free to give me a follow on Instagram over at Thread and Needlefish. I've been practicing a lot of different embroidery stitches lately, so sometimes I show y'all little peeks of what I'm doing over there. But again, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy these vlogs. I hope you enjoy the content that I have coming up, and I will talk to you very soon. Bye!